Hello, my name is Shane McArdle and I'm coming to you today from Kongsberg Digital here in Oslo. So today I'm going to talk to you about the key challenge faced by the industry, namely how to become data driven at scale and the role that Cognitwin, our digital twin, plays in solving that challenge. So I'm going to talk about data driven connector refinery uh, specifically. So what we're seeing is there's a digital transformation going on in the industry right now and, and, and it's really very, very much underpinned by these three pillars. So net carbon neutral, uh, we've seen a lot of pledges and commitments from the industry, you know, around 2050, very aggressive pledges, I would say. Um, autonomous operations, so this is also uh, a kind of a concept that's uh, going around, but it's becoming more and more important in order to support this green shift that's actively ongoing now in our industry as we see it. And then, of course, the digital worker. How, how can we enable and empower uh, our workers remotely uh, with, with the digital tools that are available today. And that's never been so important as it has been in the last 12 months with COVID-19. Really what we want to understand here is how we can accelerate to contribute to just a better model. So what's the current status of the industry? We have, we have a lot of challenges ongoing and we need to challenge that convention. We, we hear from industrial companies, uh, the analyst community, how, how you know, doing more with your data actually has a lot of value and it can be realized through data-driven operations. So to really achieve this value, companies need to become more data-driven at scale. And that's what we see. Um, if we focus here, how, how do you actually get that flexibility though? Because every single asset that we've been working with comes with a different maturity. It comes with either uh, a different maturity in the data quality, a different maturity in the capability to transform, a different maturity to be able to onboard uh, these type of changes from an organ that the organization requires, or even just you know the technology that's currently available in the facility today. So you need to be able to have something that's flexible, that can fit into the needs and actually drive this change very, very quickly. So megatrends, and this is this is an important thing to note that we see a lot of these megatrends uh, bleeding over from what we call the consumer world, where you do a purchase online, you know, with Amazon or Netflix, all the way into uh, the industrial world. And, and there's a lot of buzzwords, I suppose, going around that are actually getting traction now, driving value and becoming more cemented in, in, in the industrial landscape. But it still needs a push, it still needs um, you know, the technology that can leverage these type of uh, mega trends that we see in the consumer world that are not quite, I would say, adaptable just into the industrial world quite yet. So IoT being one, hybrid machine learning, which is like a mix around your, your physics-based simulators constraining data-driven models, uh, AR, VR, you know, drones, uh, you know, the ITOT convergence that we see a lot of. Um, so all of these mega trends now are now being realized and, and changing how we will work in uh, the refinery world. But the difference is, the difference between consumer data and industrial data, it, there's a large gap between that. It, it, it's, it's immense, right? So what we see, consumer data, it's, it's relatively available, you know, and, and there's millions and millions of data points to go with it as well. Whereas if we compare that into the industrial world, data is siloed, it's locked down into these systems, and, and they don't really work well uh trying to get one system talking to another system you know these these data systems or these enterprise systems are actually built to be uh siloed because they want to control their environment so the world is against you if you try to break them open and democratize that data so we also see that you know these system integrations are difficult as i mentioned um, the capability to be able to connect anywhere in the world uh, from any location uh, from anywhere just in your asset uh, is also something that we need to be able to handle uh, and the need is going there. The amount of data we're collecting now in, in the industrial data is just exponentially growing and having more data doesn't fundamentally make things easier, it's making things more com complicated. Decisions are becoming more complicated because you have more and more data at your fingertips. Um, the manual processes and practices used to just capture this data, structure this data, clean this data, it's a one-off job every time, and, and this needs to be codified. You need to automate these processes. You need to automate away the waste uh, that people spend weeks and weeks and, uh, of their time doing before they actually get to the value and the useful uh, use cases. 
And then finally, the practices that we have and the knowledge capture and the sharing capabilities and the collaboration capabilities uh, that we have around this, um, that's not quite in place yet. There's some some organizations are, are quite mature and they have some maybe bespoke systems or they're beginning to think about systems that are fit for purpose for them, but they don't think about the broader organization or maybe their colleagues in other refineries or other parts of the value chain. So we need to consider how we can collaborate better across our value chain and across uh, our colleagues. So why data-driven productivity? Um, so, you know, for one, we've seen uh, during COVID-19 that many organizations have shifted to remote working models almost overnight, right? And if we look at, if we look at here, you know, what, what does that actually mean? Um, two areas, the cost, cost of human error, right? So, so maintenance turnaround uh, has high cost. Um, just uh, 80 to 90 percent of these unplanned shutdowns are caused by human error. It's a significant number. Uh, we can also see uh, the number here related to in, in dollars, so 47 million dollars, uh, where which can be applied to the data driven gap. So, 81 percent of people, workers currently today in the industrial setting, are frustrated by the lack of ability to be able to access data that's either in their colleagues, uh, you know, um, systems, in, either in proprietary lockdown systems or just in another person's head. So it's very, very frustrating. And this equates to about 5.3 hours uh, per week just in waste of time trying to collect and get access to that data. How can you be data driven if, if this is a frustration that you face every single day? I mean, 66% of all delays extend longer than a week are directly attributed to uh, not being able to get access to the information that you require to do your job. So data-driven productivity, there's a large gap there to be filled uh, by making operations more data-driven. So Cognitwin. Cognitwin is Kongsberg Digital's digital twin. And uh, as you can see here, it's a, it's a, a virtual replica of your physical reality um, and its dynamic behavior. So that's very, very important. It's not just a snapshot. It's not just a, a, a twin that covers, you know, a 3D model or just has an overview of all your documents in one place. It, it does include all of those things and more. We're really going beyond the visual. And we want to look at the actual behavior. How is your asset actually behaving at any given time? Um, how is it performing at any given time? Can you identify bottlenecks uh, at any given time? Can you collaborate with your colleagues uh, across multiple devices at any given time. So there's a lot involved and a lot that's contributed to uh, through Cognitwin. And we really want to turn organizations into data science organizations, no longer just being reactive, but being more proactive through this tool. Cognitwin has been developed in very close collaboration with the industry. So over uh, the last couple of years, um, it's built to address the challenges of the industry. It's built to scale and it's built to uh, automate a lot of the waste that we see today and address the challenges that I just discussed. Breaking on, down those silos, democratizing your data, being able to create a link and integrations between various systems, mm -hmm. having very open architecture. So it's not a lock -in, it's not another lock-in system, very open using very modern um, coding uh, practices, very modern like the DevOps, using um, open uh, tools and code uh, so that thing, nothing's locked in, nothing's proprietary. Um, it's cloud enabled, it's web first, you can connect to multiple devices. So it's it's very much where a digital integrator with your existing systems. We're not there to replace, we're there to integrate and elevate the value that you can actually get from these digital services. Always connected, always aware. So, so just to walk you through some of the capabilities here. First of all, our is being connected, right? Connected to your data, right? Having access to data is one thing, but it's 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 not about having access to a hundred percent of your data because not all data is relevant. There's a lot of data gaps in in our industry, a lot of bad data in our industry, which just creates you know garbage in, garbage out. Um, you want data to relevant, good quality data in context. So if you have one piece of information, you have it in context with another piece of information. So when cognitive, when we have a query capability, so it's like a a Google search for industrial data. You can type in a piece of a tag name and all of the relevant pieces of data associated with that tag name. It could be photogrammetry, it could be a 3D model if you have that, it could 
be LIDAR models or drone scans of older facilities. Uh, it can be geographical information, it can be video streaming, anything related to that tag becomes available uh, in a search format. Uh, it's very intuitive, very easy to find, uh, and it's all in context. So one piece of data is in context to another piece of data. So that's very, very important, and it solves a lot of the use cases that we actually hear from, from the industry. Finally, or sorry, next we have this hybrid machine learning. Um, this is really the best of both worlds. So what we see is pure data-driven models can be quite limited in our industry, and that, that's due to the fact that you just don't have all the data, and you don't have enough relevant data or correct data to be able to build a model that can scale. So you might be able to do a one-off. So you, you really struggle with this, like you know, going from a proof of concept to a proof of scale. Uh, and that's that's what we hear a lot about, lots of POCs, but not, not a lot of scaling of those POCs. And then it ends up in this, you know, winterland of, you know, oh, does digitalization work or not? And especially around the data-driven part, we find hybrid machine learning is a better, more robust, and more scalable solution. So it's data models, as I mentioned, very fast, but sometimes they lack the data and sometimes they lack the events. In a lot of cases, uh, you want to predict an abnormal condition, but we, we try to run our facilities in 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 a as healthy position as possible we don't want to step outside the operating envelope so then when you want to predict something we're going well we don't have the information to predict on how do you backfill this data gap that we have and this is where high fidelity um very robust physics-based models come into play so they, they've been well known and well used you know simulators uh, high fidelity simulators have been well used for, for decades in, in our industry. But what we've seen is they're, they're quite heavy, they're very high fidelity, very accurate, but they're also very heavy to use and they're limited to a very small group of specialists. Uh, you have, I suppose, production optimization on demand, which is one or two times a year where you put in a request, you asked uh, the specialist team to do some analysis for you, and you got it back, and then you took some actions, and then you waited for the next time to do it. So what you want to do is take this on-demand request into more real time. So you're doing uh, optimization all the time on the fly in, in real time. And that's where you combine your data models that can be fed and trained using synthetic data from physics models. Or if you have all the relevant data, you want to constrain those data models. And that's where you use the simulators to validate your, your, um, your model. Um, and then it scales very, very quickly through the cognitive environment. Location services, so we talk about how how can you do more remotely. So if one thing COVID taught us all from a work per perspective is, you know, our facilities, our assets can be maintained, can be operated without having to have physical presence at that site or a minimum physical presence at that site. Has it been, I would say, the most efficient and effective? No. Uh, but those organizations that have rigged themselves prior to COVID-19, you know, maybe moving to um, Teams or a Zoom environment to, to collaborate, that's been very, very, uh, uh, let's say, has con contributed a lot to that organization being able to um, very quickly overnight work, start working remotely. Um, within the twin, we have these services we're scaled out on Microsoft Azure. So we have in tightly integrated uh, Teams. So you actually can uh, remotely log in, you can remotely check, you can see what's happening in real time and have this uh, conversation and collaboration uh, in real time. Um, you see the next one, uh, the collaboration uh, point here. You can have it across multiple devices, so it's not just it's not just in your laptop. It can be tablets. It can be on these um, uh, wearable devices that are approved, ATEX rated approved to go into these facilities. Um, so it's really about being able to collaborate effectively and easily, uh, and having access to all of your data. That, that's fundamental to in uh, this shift, this remote shift. Finally, sustainability. You know, sustainability and profitability can go hand in hand. And a lot of what we've seen is with this green shift, there are so much you can do with your product mix. So you can shift to uh, a cleaner product mix. But there is, they are, and we will see a lot of these assets that traditionally has been labeled as, as kind of the dirty part of, of oil and gas, they're going to continue because there's a need for those resources. But we can operate them better. We can be better. You know, and building transparency into those operations, connecting actions from, you know, any field worker to a CO2 footprint of that facility helps curb the behaviors of people. So you can actually reduce, actively reduce your CO2 footprint, which will contribute to this green shift. And that's very, very important 
that we continue to support these assets and and enable them to be able to uh, have a significant impact on um, and in, in influence on how we do this green shift because eventually we this will fade out but it's going to take decades and this is where a lot of the commitments are coming in 2050 and beyond because we know we need that time but in that time we can do a lot of good so here here's where we're trying to deliver just to show you some examples where we're delivering a lot of insights uh, wherever you need it whenever you need it with the right data at your fingertips so it's as i mentioned we're, we're, we're scaled out on microsoft uh, here we're integrating tightly teams with uh, the twin on the other side so it's very very easy if you have that uh, already in your in your organization we just connect it up quickly um, we're looking at the various areas that we can actually mm -hmm. uh, address and I, I you know i'll go into this in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides but um this is fundamental getting access to your data at any time driving the changes with that data and having having the capabilities to collaborate fundamentally important so a lot of what we do is you know it's operational technology that's where the magic happens you know it's it's what can you do right down at your control system can we have a more advanced algorithm can we have um, advanced process control down there you know that's where some not some a lot of the influence and uh, impact is realized at that at that part of uh, the organization but it is a big driver and we're seeing this itot convergence but it has to be underpinned by data-driven knowledge so everything we've done in go between has been as i said developed in close collaboration with the industry uh, all of the insight and thought has come from the needs and requirements of the users of this technology uh, it's always been about how do we make life easier so we want a common view of the data we keep hearing this back we want to make drive uh, data-driven operations uh, as a you know deeply into the organization and across the organization so it just becomes something that we do every single day but we need to make it simple we need to make it intuitive and we can't make it to uh, you know so complex that people are just going to give up on it and it'll enter into one of these another failed poc that never actually uh took wing and actually had impact so that's very very important and we feel the components that we have, the data pipelines, the contextualization engine, the model engines that I mentioned, uh, the open architecture to simplify things. Uh, so you can plug in, if you have models yourself uh, already developed, you can plug them in. If you have a third party system that you're very fond of and that you believe brings a lot of value, plug it in. It just allows for a lot of open collaboration with existing partners. You have a good partner ecosystem and technology ecosystem. And it gives you just one common view. So it does start with your data. You have to make it available. And I mentioned, just to show you uh, a little bit, uh, to focus in on the architecture that I had there in the previous slide, um, we automate this. Everything, we have a large library of connections. A, it's not a, the uh, idea isn't to come in and replace or be another enterprise system. It's connect what you have all of those solid data sources. You do it very, very quickly. You do it very, very robustly. Um, you pump them to these data pipeline, as we call it. Um, you break down the silos between these systems. So one piece of information can be had in context with the second piece of information. And you can see here, it's very uh, codified and very, very simple interface. Um, and this is the part where we start to contextualize. So you wanna unify that information that you have maybe in your ERP system together with the data that you may have in your transaction or business system um, to your real-time series data. So this helps not only unify the data, but it's the people and the knowledge those people have. So we're really working to digitalize workflows uh, once this is done and, and have a direct impact on the organization. Again, this is just, this is an automatic, we use advanced analytics to build this uh, contextualization, this search query capability, all of this is done automatically. And every time you have a new piece of data, you just add it. You just run it through the same engine, and it automatically becomes part of uh, your search capability, your 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 data workflows, your your uh, workflow enablement packages. So you can see here, just uh, showing you some some of these capabilities and how they're visualized. So if you have a 3D model, that's great. You can actually navigate through a 3D model. But if you don't, fine. We have a lot of uh, 2D workflows, uh, very simplified workflows for people that. Uh, just want to do one particular task. If you want to work on PNIDs, for example, all of them are made smart. We have capabilities that can scrape all of that data, so it automatically lifts information from 
a scan document. It doesn't even have to be a native document. And we can connect that information uh, back to another piece of uh, data that actually is more structured. So we take unstructured, structured data, it doesn't matter. And we try to elevate. A part of this, a lot of people at this point say, oh, my data is old, or I don't have it in a right organization, or the hierarchies aren't correct. We try to elevate that data conversation and say, look, it doesn't matter. Let's just start. We can just ingest the data. We can contextualize it, and we can actually drive and deliver a report that automatically spits out and says, hey, this is where this tag to document to maybe asset doesn't, doesn't connect, or this is where there's a gap in your, in your data, or this is missing on one piece of your information uh, that should be that we expected to find here in this system. It's missing compared to the other system where you can actually find it. So we elevate this conversation very quickly and we can quickly show what is possible because regardless of how old or brown your facility is, every single asset we've worked with uh, over the last couple of years, there is a possibility to digitalize and improve. Here, so here's some of the areas, so some of the key, not all of them, but some of the key areas I want to talk about. So how do you collaborate to drive productivity? So turn turnaround insights, this is where a lot of the costs can be found in the downstream market, especially around refineries. How do you make that better? How do you collaborate better? How do you plan better? How do you uh, reduce that operating window, maintenance window? We have uh, energy insights. A lot of what we do, let's say, for onshore facilities, where here in Norway, for example, there's been a lot of companies that are electrified, so they've uh, connected to the grid, but they still have a high cost on energy usage, so offtake optimization. Uh, and you also see it's one of the main contributors to, to CO2 footprint. So we've, we've built, in collaboration with uh, certain assets and some third-party vendors, algorithms that can help focus on this, improve this uh, energy usage, um, have better performance on it. And finally, all the way over into the production side. As I mentioned before, traditionally you have on-demand production optimization, so it's one or two times a year. We want to move this over to more real-time cadence. So you have access to real-time serious data. Why not use that? Why not identify bottlenecks in, on the go in real time? Why can't you um, optimize in real time? And it shouldn't just be locked into a certain persona, a uh, very specialized persona. It should be available to everyone uh, that has an interest in doing this and be able to do it intuitively and easily. So that's really where we democratize not just the data, but also knowledge and capability. And down below is where you can see a specific workflow where we see multiple people working and collaborating together across, you know, uh, a main, this is in, in this particular case, they're looking at maintenance of this piece of equipment. Um, you want to understand, okay, where, where in the PNIDs is this located? Um, when's the last time it was uh, maintained? So you can pull up a data sheet, you can pull up logs from an external consultant that came in. Uh, so you can even write back uh, and actually uh, set up uh, a work order here as well. So that's very, very important. In addition, we have something called simultaneous operations where you have a complete overview of your operations. So if you're doing a piece of work in this specific area this week, but also next week you see, hey, there's a bit of electrical uh, work going on as well. Why don't we use the opportunity or take the opportunity to do the maintenance on both these facilities at the same time? And this has had a significant amount of savings, uh, uh, which was a little bit surprising because uh, the, the amount of cost in just putting up scaffolding, taking down scaffolding week after week, and not just having an overview of where electrical maintenance work is being taken place, that was, that was quite interesting and was very surprising when we actually implemented that. People think this is a big process, something that you have to really you know, get a lot of people behind. It's, it's not the case. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to have a greenfield asset with you know, the perfect data, uh, not at all. If you want a unified overview of your, of your landscape, of your, of your landscape and have, a, have this modern work surface that everyone can use, it can be done as quick as eight weeks. And this here is just an example of an asset that we did, brown, very brownfield assets, 30 years old. Um, they'd started some of the work on improving their data, but it wasn't all done. We, we received uh, external hard drive of about a million scanned documents. It was, it was, it was that, I would say, immature in, in its digital journey. And we were able to connect up all of these data sources that you can see, so about 15 different data sources, um, contextualize them, ingest them. Uh, we had some workflows that were already pre-built. And this was standing up in eight weeks, and we got uh, 50 users on board with it. Uh, that's now grown to 150. 
Um, it's everyone from supply chain right down to the field service engineers, and they've now provided uh, user access to consultants as well, so they can do a lot of the work remotely. So this is a this is a perfect example of a, I would say, immature um, asset brownfield old, and how quickly we can get it up and running. And it's great to hear, you know, feedback like, oh, we'll never go back to the way we worked before, or how was I doing my job uh, previously. Uh, this is significant savings around you know turnaround and maintenance. So and and the enthusiasm of people here is is just great. It's fantastic feedback. Uh, this is some overview of all the types of information we 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 kind of integrated and some of the workflows that we've enabled for them here as well. Right. So I mentioned at the start, data driven operations. It shouldn't be siloed. It's it's just like any other proof of concept. If it just if it just doesn't go anywhere. And you you don't have the possibility for moving from proof of concept to proof of scale. You're not going to get that return on investment. You're really not. So you have to have a tool or a technology partner that knows how to scale and has a technology that can scale across multiple assets. Then you can start looking at you know benchmark sharing. You can do remote sharing between one facility to another facility. Shared capabilities. You can do you can slice around excellence. So for example, you want to look at how are all my distillation columns working across my entire portfolio? Why are they working much better here? How can we take lessons learned from this uh, facility back to another facility? Uh, you can slice it across you know, maintenance processes because what we see is a lot of organizations, they have maybe invested in similar enterprise systems or setups, so like same email, same uh, like SharePoint, it could be, for example, same ERP system. They have the same processes. They have the same procedures. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, their facilities are built by the same EPCs, but they operate so differently. So where is where's the gap and how do you take and share that knowledge from a high performing facility to maybe a lower performing facility? So there's a lot you can do once you start scaling and that, that's fundamental. And you should have an, uh, a tool that has those capabilities and not just built to be a POC tool because we see a lot of challenges there that also the tech has a challenge to scale beyond the POC as well. Finally, from a sustainability point of view, and this is, this is just through our observations, that as we scaled it out across uh, our customers, their portfolio, it actually had a significant impact on the overall CO2 footprint. So first of all, it provided this transparency. So this is just a thought to leave with you. It's not just about production optimization, cost cutting. It really has an impact on, 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 your, on your sustainable business model as well. So a lot of the workers, and uh, to be honest here, uh, this was driven by COVID-19, but the frustrations they were, uh, let's say, living with it before the twin were very much mitigated very quickly once they had a twin, once they were able to come in, collaborate within one environment. And, and this is where we heard a lot about, hey, we're definitely going to do this again. We're going to actually reduce the amount of on-site personnel that we need, or we don't need some consultants uh, coming in as much or as often. We can do this using remote services and capabilities. Um, we see around the optimization, especially on like um, just being transparent on your CR2 usage and some of those actions that you take as a day-to-day -day worker, how that has an impact on the overall uh, carbon footprint of your asset, curb those behavioral instincts, how you can build up, uh, let's say, advanced algorithms and scale them. So it's not just even locked to a single asset, it's uh, scaled across an entire facility and can be scaled from facility to facility. So uh, there's a lot you can do here uh, to improve stuff. So I'm going to leave you there. I um, hope you give me some thoughts for why uh, data-driven operations and a connected refinery and, uh, can lead to a significant impact on your top line, your bottom line, and overall uh, your sustainable uh, footprint of your, of your facility. We are here, and we're going to be part of the, the sessions, the other sessions. We're going to be part of uh, some... Uh, moderated panels uh, so please drop me a line if you want to hear more and um, thank you very much for the opportunity have a good day and enjoy the conference